I wasn't an obsessive record collector, but um, I was someone who would go to a record store when I was in Berkeley five or six times a week. Is there a new Miles Davis record? Is there a new Joni Mitchell record? Is there a new Bob Dylan record? Is there a new Beatles record? I was always seeing the next thing that was going to happen with great anticipation. Record labels used to mean something different 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago and will mean something different 10 years from now. We know that for a fact. To people who love music, labels have never meant a lot. Uh, it's the artists that mean something. And I think it's been our opinion too that what's most important is not none such. It's, it's Steve Reich or uh, Wilco or uh, Used to endure, and in that I think there's a similarity to, to BAM and the way BAM has, you know, programmed these buildings over the last 30 years, is that there's a belief in artists and 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 their incredible capabilities and their incredible inspiration and what they mean to us as human beings and what they mean to our culture, and a faith that there is an audience that is much broader than it is conventionally depicted to be. I think that when you sign and work with an artist whose music you respect or love or cherish, and you know it's good, that is not a risk. I think we've been fortunate to be guessing on our own taste. And I've always felt that if we fail with our own taste, that's okay. To fail doing what you think is right is never um, a bad thing in life. I think when you fail because you're doing something you think other people want you to do, then I think that you haven't had the courage to stand up for your own convictions. The, the notion that a record company is more than just a place where you put out records of people, I think is kind of central to the way we have been through the years. It is a kind of family. It's a family amongst musicians, the colleagues who work with us, and the larger musical community. And it's been a real blessing for all of us. I was, I was hired on Valentine's Day 1984, which by chance was also um, the 20th anniversary of the company. I remember walking down 55th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, sort of a third of the way on the block. And I had this thought that, okay, this is an opportunity I'm never going to have again. This is that moment where you know that you've been tapped on the shoulder um, and that you have to go to whatever extremes that you can to make this thing be what you want it to be. I loved what was happening in that revolution that today is called minimalism that was going on at that moment. The last thing, none such before I got there, would have ever done is to record Phil Glass or Steve Reich. It just was never going to happen. At that time, they were young, they were controversial, they were not accepted in the classical canon. I think what we shared was this sense that there were things going on outside the traditional definitions of, of classical music, jazz, contemporary composers, all of it. Uh, that w was incredibly exciting and that none such could potentially be a home for that. Before I even got to Nunsuch, I um, began a relationship with Harvey Lichtenstein, um, who was the president of BAM at that time. Um, and obviously I was attracted to BAM because at the beginnings of the Next Wave Festival, they were doing a lot of projects that were very close to my heart.
One of my earliest and most profound experiences in terms of an artist who ultimately became part of our label was seeing Laurie Anderson's United States Parts 1 to 4 at BAM. Seeing that really represented, um, in many ways, the things that Bob and I were, were already talking about in terms of where we thought music was going. You know, in its combination of theater and music and text and technology, uh, there was something new happening. Before I was at, um, at Nonesuch, I had heard John Adams' music and I called Harvey up. And I said to Harvey, I've just heard this incredible composer, this piece Shaker Loops, you've got to hear it. Harvey insisted we send a messenger out to BAM. Um, and two years later, Nixon in China, or three years later, Nixon in China, was performed here for the first time. The idea that um, BAM would be able to see it, it put, put itself in a position to present people who come from the classical music world and the modern music world and the jazz and so-called world music and rock and alternative and folk and bluegrass all in the same place. It's just an amazing, kind of astonishing thing that it's even happening in this world today. It's an extraordinary commitment, I think, by BAM to make in terms of putting on a festival of three weeks of music. It's a renewal in some ways of BAM's own involvement and commitment to new music. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to both look back and look forward uh, in terms of what has been accomplished over those years and what we're still hoping to accomplish because we sort of feel like we're just getting started.